everyone welcome to another lecture for delivery engineering and principles we have been talking about route specific delivery so uh, essentially what route to choose for various applications we have discussed several routes already and uh, we have been now discussing inhalation so let's quickly recap of what we did in the last class so in the last class we finished our discussion on the transdermal administration where we talked about micro needles which are these small structures from 100 to 500 micron big and uh, they when they penetrate the skin they only go deep enough to um, bypass the stratum corneum but does not go and touch the nerves and the blood cells which uh, uh, is what will cause the pain and they are actually very effective in terms of uh, enhancing the permeation so, that is one bioengineering approach. The another is to use ionic liquids, uh, these are organic salts that have high solubility for lipid and other kinds of uh, uh, molecules and they have been shown to enhance the permeation, so, they are basically you can classify as, um, as a chemical enhancers and so they are able to enhance the permeability by quite a high amount and we saw an example of insulin where if you just imply ins insulin on the skin it does not diffuse in, but if you apply it with these ionic liquids uh, it actually uh, penetrates quite uh, uniformly throughout the whole skin. And then we started inhalation where first we discussed lung biology where we said that uh, uh, once you inhale things uh, the air has to bifurcate several times uh, almost uh, all the way to 17 to 23 times before it reaches the final uh, compartment which is nothing but alveolar sacs which are being surveyed by macrophages quite a lot and, uh, and this is where the major absorption of the drugs happen these alveolar sacs are actually very close to a blood vessel. So this layer is uh, all just a single cell layer. and you have your blood cells floating around through this blood vessel. So, the absorption happens quite uh, quite a lot at this, this is where the gas exchange also happens. So, your oxygen goes in here and your CO2 from the blood gets exchanged and so the lung is that is why heavy, heavily vascularized because all the um, oxygen that we get happens at the exchange at the lung itself. So, um, that is one and then we talked about how particle deposition uh, on the basis of size happens in the lung. So, what we found is especially for the deep lung if we are looking for particle deposition we are looking at a value which is something like this uh, where uh, this range is about 1 to 5 microns anything below gets exhaled out. and anything above uh, gets deposited in the upper respiratory tract. So, that is what we had discussed in the last class, let us continue our discussion on inhalation uh, uh, in this class. So, then there are several types of inhalation, one is called nebulizer and uh, you might have seen this in the hospital setting. Um, this is uh, nothing but uh, there is a small nozzle that can go in the mouth and uh, then there is some kind of a compressor that generates uh, small droplets. So, your drug will be put in these tubings and, uh, and these small droplets will be generated. So, what happens is uh, you have these small small mist like water droplets that are carrying your drug and they are generated in the size range of about 1 to 5 micron. So, when you inhale them they go and end up depositing deep in the lungs where uh, obviously this is just a water layer. So, that will um, just burst and uh, your drug can then free to move around and get absorbed through the blood vessel. So, as I discussed this generates mist that are inhaled in the lungs, um, it uses compressed air uh, and ultrasonic power to break the solution. So, the solution and the drug can be filled in here or here and uh, whatever is filled in because of the pressure and the ultrasonic power 
generates mist or these aerosol droplets. This works very well in the hospital setting, uh, it is a fairly um, complex instrument to use, uh, so not something that uh, one can use at their houses, but, uh, but in the hospital setting it works very well, otherwise it is not very convenient to use. So, that is why um, if we really want a patient compliant system, um, we um, dry powder inhalation is one of the way to go about it because this is something that the patients can actually self administer. For the previous case, the patient will have to go to the hospital. So, if you are looking for a therapy uh, that requires uh, nebulizer, then it is not going to be patient compliant as the patient every time he suffers from something or if it is a daily dose, then they will have to go daily to the hospitals. So, let us talk about dry powder inhalation, uh, it is extremely patient compliant and easy to use again as I, as I said uh, multiple times. So, you might have seen patients uh, with asthma using these dry powder inhalers and it is actually very well accepted by the patient. Um, since it is in the dry format, uh, the drug stability is quite a lot improved. So, most of the reactions, uh, uh, most of the contamination that may cause degradation, maybe enzyme contamination, those will only work in aqueous environment. So, um, if you have a completely dry powder based solution, powder based uh, drug, it is not going to be uh, degradable to any of those components. So, its stability is actually vastly enhanced. And then uh, in this case, if you are trying to deliver particles, then the powder particles should be at around 1 to 5 micron for deep lung delivery. And then uh, typically some excipients are also added, uh, so that uh, you can uh, add your drug on to these excipients. And so, when I say excipient, these are nothing but small irregular shape particles uh, on which you can then adsorb your drug. And these particles could be made out of sugars. And this have two purposes, for one is uh, they act as carrier for whatever free drug it is and uh, they will deliver the drug to the deep lung because if you only give deliver the drug which is very, very small, uh, that drug is going to get exhaled out, it would not deposit. So, um, that is one advantage, the other advantage is it actually act as a uh, protectant at the process of drying. So, when you are drying, you are doing some kind of a, uh, either cryo or uh, some other method and these sugars act as a very good protectant for that. So, something like lactose is very commonly used, mannitol is another one. And here is the example that I was giving you. So, these are these uh, small sugar molecules and you can see that the drug is actually adsorbed on it and uh, because these molecules are fairly large, they have a actually very large momentum and when the air flows, uh, the air is able to separate these out very well. So, all of them will get different uh, velocities in different directions and that causes the separation. So, these particles then become very good in terms of delivering the drug to the deep lung. However, uh, this is not a controlled release because whatever drug you are putting in uh, is immediately available. So, um, if the drug is extremely small, which most drugs are, let us say 1 nanometer, 2 nanometer, these drugs are going to get immediately into the system. So, it works very well in terms of the delivery with the dry powder, but now if we talk about uh, the control and sustained release, which is the major part of this course, you do not really get that with this particular system. So, that is where then the materials come in. So, maybe we can make particles, which can then encapsulate these drugs. So, rather than releasing the drug immediately, we can have these particles, have them in the right size range and then deliver them through inhalation. So, instead of using the sugars, we may be using particle or maybe a mixture of particle and sugar and uh, then rely on these size ranges and aerodynamic properties to deposit deep in the lungs. Once they are deposited deep in the lungs, uh, because we know that the mucus clearance is very low in deep lungs, uh, they will act as a depot and then they can slowly degrade and release whatever they are carrying. So, before I talk about particles uh, with that with that properties, let us let us discuss one of the property which is aerodynamic diameter. So, um, this is nothing but again the particle size range for deep lung delivery via pulmonary route we already discussed is 1 to 5 micron, but what I did not tell you earlier is this 1 to 5 micron is defined as aerodynamic diameter range that it needs to be in. So, what is aerodynamic diameter? 
this is nothing but this is the diameter of a sphere of a density 1000 kg per meter cube with same settling velocity as a particle of interest. So, this is a theoretical term. So, again if I have to define this, this is theoretical term. It does not really have any physical meaning, but it is something which is defined which is a diameter of a sphere with this density. And uh, so, if you if we are dealing with spheres with our, which are polymeric, those densities typically lie at around 1000 to 1200. So, um, that means that the physical diameter is actually equal to the aerodynamic diameter. However, if the particle density is different or if the uh, particle is irregular shaped then uh, this is not the case and you will have to uh, calculate the aerodynamic diameter for your uh, particular uh, particle. So, this is nothing but to standardize the shape and the density. So, uh, again the water is the same density as this, so are the polymers. So, you can do that, that this is measured by an instrument called cascade impactor which we will come to in a moment and essentially what it is doing it is taking into account. Uh, various drag forces. So, if let us say you have a particle which is shaped like this, you will then have to assume it to be a sphere which is somewhere uh, um, in between the two axes of the particle um, and then you are basically measuring how much is the drag uh, on your area system and then equating it to this hypothetical sphere that you have drawn and that is how you can then uh, calculate the aerodynamic diameter. So, if you have if you have let us say a particle with a density of 4000 kg per meter cube, that is going to give you um, some diameter if you model it at 4000 kg per cube, but since it is the density is very high, the drag is going to be lower for this. So, to compensate for that, you actually increase the size of this uh, to say that okay, and that aerodynamic diameter will have be this diameter rather than this diameter, because now the density is different, so the drag will be different. So, what you are saying is these two have the same drag uh, even though they have different densities and different diameters and that is what you are essentially comparing it to. So, now what we have learned is uh, for the right size range you want the aerodynamic diameter to be 1 to 5 micron and for whatever particle type you are using you will have to find a term to equate your physical parameters the physical length breadth and the height of your particle to this aerodynamic diameter and density and I, I mentioned that cascade impactor is used to measure the aerodynamic diameter. So, one is to you, you do all these theoretical calculations, but that requires you to know several parameters which may or may not exist for a particular uh, type of material that you are using and a particular shape. So, what you can do is you can do it experimentally and this is called a cascade impactor. So, um, this is nothing, but it is a lung model. for uh, flow for aero flow and what it contains it contains a pump that is pumping in air at a similar uh, um, velocity that the that what we breathe in and it has several plates which is actually acting as the bifurcation uh, points in our branchioles and several of them. So, and this plate is uh, coated with some sticky substance. So, that whatever in comes in contact with this plate gets stuck there and uh, it is so designed that it actually models each and every of the um, bifurcations, trifurcations of our airways. So, now what you are modeling is if something is coming and it is able to change its direction with the air and continue to grow, go at some point it will start depositing and depending on where it is depositing you can determine what is the model aerodynamic diameter. So, you already have run some standards and you know which plate uh, will deposit a certain aerodynamic diameter and with your particular particles you can then see which plate is accumulating the most and, and get a distribution of your aerodynamic diameter in your particle settings. So, again uh, for most inhalation based uh, uh, delivery this is something that is uh, used to characterize your formulations. Okay. So, having having learned all that uh, I did mention one thing that uh, our alveolar sacs contain these macrophages 
which uh, are surveying these alveolar sacs whatever is coming in and if they find anything foreign they are going to clear it by uptaking it. Now that creates a problem because we said to deposit deep in the lung we need 1 to 5 micron d arrow. However, uh, we know that for at least for polymeric particles which is what we have been discussing quite a bit in this course and for spherical particles at least you have this uh, d is equal to d arrow. So, now what I am saying is for polymeric particles I will still be trying to make them at 1 to 5 micron. However, these macrophages that are there they have very high clearance of this size particle range they are actually optimized to take up particles in the size range. So, now if I am delivering something which is in this size range and hoping it is going to make a deeper it is actually not going to make a deeper what will happen is these macrophages are going to take this up and clear it from my body. So, that is a problem right because I do not for most of the drugs if I am trying to deliver it to the macrophages well and good this is the perfect size. But if I am trying to deliver it to go to systemic circulation or trying to deliver it to go to epithelial cells make a depot there release things over time that will not happen because these macrophages will clear them away. So, to prevent that and this is again just saying the same thing that the particle size for the macrophage uptake is also 1 to 5 micron. So, to prevent that what we can do is we can change the porosity of these particles. Once we change the porosity we are essentially changing the density and now we are changing the density we are now changing the drag. So, then what we are saying is this equation will no longer be true. In fact, this will change depending on the density if the density is going up or down your diameter will also change to be equal to the aerodynamic diameter. So, that is what is done. So, uh, what you can do is you can make them extremely porous that means that the density goes down which means that uh, so, if I write the equation for the aerodynamic diameter I am talking about uh, if let us say everything else is uh, the same I am saying d is equal to the physical diameter is d sorry d arrow is equal to d multiplied by square root of density. So, now if I have uh, decrease the density to get the same aerodynamic diameter I can actually increase the physical diameter the actual diameter. So, that is what is done. So, if you make it extremely porous you can increase the size. So, as you have seen here this is extremely porous. So, now it is mostly air and the polymer is much in lower amounts the density from let us say 1.2 gram per cc has gone down to about let us say 0 0.3 0 0.4 gram per cc that has allowed me to change this 1 to 5 micron size range to let us say here 8 to 10 micron multiplied by the square root of the density. So, once I do that that means that uh, now my particles are much bigger 10 micron particles are just physically too big for these macrophages to be able to clear them away. So, now I can still get that depot. So, what you are what I have said written here is cannot be phagocytosed by the macrophages and not only that the larger the particle the more its momentum is and uh, because of that they tend to separate very well from the other particles. So, you actually have less aggregation uh, when you try to aerosolize these particles. So, uh, this is required because let us say in if you are in a dry format if 4 particles clump together and do not separate out when they flow in the air that will lead to quite a bit of a problem because now uh, they are actually not in 1 to 5 micron they are in 4 to 20 micron range and uh, that is not what you want. So, it is very important that when you aerosolize these these particles separate out and so larger the particle the easier it is for it to separate. So, these are the two advantages that it gives me and now I can use this particle and encapsulate my drug inside this is this is of course, biodegradable we can make it out of PLGA let us say. So, this is biodegradable and uh, as it degrades the drug will continue to release out and go into the systemic circulation. Okay. So, let us talk about so that is all I had for the inhalation let us talk about an another delivery format which is uh, buccal or also called sublingual. 
So, this is a very traditional delivery method not used as much these days and uh, so I, I doubt any of you might have actually uh, used uh, buckle delivery with any tablets, but what it is is uh, you take a tablet and you just keep it under your tongue for a longer duration and that region is called the buccal cavity. So, anything below your tongue uh, all that cheek all that region uh, is buccal cavity. So, something like chewing gum is a classic example which uh, basically all the taste is getting through the buccal cavity. And so, these are typically tiny tablets because you cannot really keep a big tablet in your mouth and let it dissolve away completely in your mouth. So, it is it is not a good feeling to keep something in the mouth for long duration. So, that is why it has uh, slowly and slowly moved away from uh, use in the clinics, but uh, still for some tablets you will find that it is recommended that the tablets be kept in the mouth for long duration. Some of the advantages here are this is actually avoiding bypass metabolism and we will come to how this actually happens, but this is not through the oral route even though you are taking it orally the absorption into the circulation is happening through a different blood vessel than what it does when you take it uh, through your stomach. So, um, so that is different and it actually avoids first person metabolism, there is rapid absorption of the drug and then of course, it is not going to uh, quite a high uh, concentration of enzymes which you find in the in your stomach. Uh, even though there are some enzymes in our mouth, um, those are in a much lower amount and much lower type. So, uh, your drug is a lot more protected when you are delivering through buccal cavity. Disadvantages again I mentioned already there is a first of all there is a probability of swallowing. So, maybe you would not be able to keep it for very long maybe it will you will just end up swallowing. As you can see here you can give very small doses because again you cannot have big things uh, uh, in your mouth floating around for quite a long time. And uh, the absorption again uh, suffers from the size range of the drug. So, if you are trying to deliver a drug which is uh, big, uh, it may not be able to permeate through your buccal mucosa. So, here is how it avoids the blood uh, the first pass metabolism. So, if we are looking at oral route, um, we are saying that oral when you eat something, uh, obviously there is buccal cavity which I said it is right under the tongue, but uh, you directly take the things to stomach once it is in the stomach and then it goes to intestine all of that goes to the through the portal vein to the liver where the first pass metabolism happens. However, there is a separate vessel uh, that is uh, carrying uh, molecules from the buccal cavity. So, here you have a vein here you have a separate uh, vessel that is carrying it directly to the systemic circulation. So, because of that uh, you are now avoiding this first first metabolism and uh, the drug is much more protected. The same thing actually happens to rectum in which we will talk about next uh, or maybe in the next uh, uh, few slides where also anything that is uh, absorbed through the rectum area uh, that is a separate vessel and that is also avoiding the first pass metabolism. So, some of the example of the sublingual delivery is. Uh, uh, nitroglycerin is de delivered to angina patients and uh, it is a very rapid absorption for at least this particular molecule, it is a very small molecule uh, that is being delivered through this route. So, here are some more examples. So, you have uh, um, an, a product by Generex Biotechnology which is called the Oral Lin and this is nothing but uh, an insulin formulation uh, which is uh, taken at the end of the meal. And in this case the drug is actually carried in lipid micelles uh, which, uh, which are then uh, asked to uh, hold down in the mouth and gives a very similar efficacy as IV injections. Okay, let us talk about rectal delivery now. So, rectal delivery as the name suggests is basically delivery uh, through the rectum and uh, this is uh, again not very widely used anymore, it is a very traditional form uh, of delivery. So, uh, something like this device is inserted into your rectum. Um, so, um, some of the so this is suppository which is nothing but a small round cone shaped object um, which is this and sometimes enema is also used which is a liquid formulation which is poured into your uh, rectum as well. 
Some of the advantages as I briefly mentioned in the previous slide, it bypasses the first pass metabolism because there is a different uh, vein that takes it to the systemic circulation and it is actually very useful for small children and babies because it is actually very hard to find uh, a blood vessel uh, for them and uh, obviously they are not going to be compliant enough to hold the drugs into their mouth. So, buccal cavity is out, blood vessels is hard to find, they have a very small muscle um, at that point of time. So, you cannot really use that area, the only other uh, remain is the subcutaneous, but again with children it is actually very difficult for them to agree with injections. So, that is one of the ways that uh, uh, people can do this and it is also something that uh, parents can easily do this. So, parents may not be comfortable handling needles, injecting their babies, they might be afraid that maybe the needle will hit a blood vessel um, which is not what they want. So, um, but this is something that the parents uh, can easily do and so um, it is very widely used for children only. Again there are several disadvantages, uh, first is the absorption depends on the disease state. So, um, and there is a degradation by bacterial flora. So, all of these uh, rectum is filled with lots of bacteria. So, these bacteria can actually degrade some of these drugs and of course, it is uh, extremely patient and compliant, it is very uncomfortable. So, uh, not a whole lot of delivery is going to happen through this route. And again we, because of the same reason, uh, even the research is not being done quite a lot through this route anymore. So, here is an example from uh, Valiant Pharmaceuticals. So, this is called the distate acudyl and uh, it is a rectum gel, the diazepam is delivered through this, this is to prevent seizures. So, if somebody is suffering from seizures, then uh, this can be given. So, again a caretaker can give this. So, the patient is of course, uh, incapacitated, so it cannot eat anything, it cannot put it in the buccal cavity. Um, if uh, the attendant is not very well trained, maybe it is the father, mother or the child. Uh, they do not really know how to do the injections, they may not have access to injections, then they can just take the suppository and put it in the rectum. As I said, this is a high need for children, uh, parents can easily administer it, even in the hospital setting, it is hard to find vein for babies and toddlers. Um, this has high lipid solubility, so it rapidly diffuses uh, into all high lipid regions and uh, this particular drug, the distate acudyl, diazepam. And the oral administration is slow to take effect uh, and then again in the babies especially you do not want to punch the muscles too much, it may cause necrosis and uh, prevent development from happening. So, here is an, another example of rectal administration, it is called the fecal microbiotransplant. Uh, so, this is one of the things that is actually very uh, widely used even now. Um, well, well, not really very widely used, but at least it is coming up in a quite a enthusiastic fashion and some research is actually going on this. And so, what it is, is uh, this is clinically used for an infection which is clostridium difficile. It causes uh, severe diarrhea, fever, abdominal pain and uh, the uh, drug, the antibiotic is not able to clear it in many cases. So, you can continue to take this drug, but a lot of time this clostridium is actually very persistent and you are not able to clear it. So, at that point what is done is a stool from a close family member, a family member that has a similar eating habits uh, like the patient is then administered through enema. So, uh, their stool is taken, it is converted into a liquid slurry and then this is administered through the rectum route. Uh, it is fairly invasive, so it is not really used for any other treatment, but uh, with this particular case, it is seen that it is actually very effective, uh, much, much uh, higher efficacy than delivering these vancomycin based uh, drugs and the patient uh, can then uh, stop suffering from uh, diarrhea and fever and um, um, this therapy is now actually used quite a lot in clinics. Okay, we will stop right here and we will continue rest in the next class. Thank you.